Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Revolutionary Left Radio. I have a wonderful episode for you today. We have back on this show Professor Kristen Gotzi, who's been on Rev Left numerous times for numerous fan favorite episodes. This time she's on to talk about the Marxist feminist Alexandra Kollontai. This is a deep dive into her life and then in the second section into her philosophy and contributions to feminism, to Marxism, um, to the struggle for, for liberation on all fronts. And you, know, you can tell when you listen to Kristen talk about Kollontai how deep of an of a influence she has had on Kristen. And Kristen just talks fluently and can talk for hours about Kollontai. So I could not have asked for a better guest. Uh, to cover the life and work of, of this amazing proletarian and feminist hero. So without further ado, we're just going to get right into the episode. I will say this, though, that since Kristen has been on so many times in the show notes to this episode, I'll make sure to actually link all the times that Kristen has been on Rev Left. So if you like this episode, which I'm sure you will, and you haven't heard some of those previous uh, interviews and discussions that we've had, uh, they'll be in the show notes so you can go back and sort of check out all the times that Kristen has uh, blessed Rev Left with her presence. And lastly, if you stick around to after the outro music, you'll hear me read an article by, by Kristen on um, Colin Ty called The Most Famous Feminist You've Never Heard Of in which, among other things, she tells a fascinating story about how Kollontai helped German Jews escape the Nazis. So listen after the outro music for that wonderful article as well. But without further ado, let's get into this wonderful episode on the life and work of Alexandra Kollontai with my friend, Kristen Gatsi. Enjoy. My name is Kristen Godsey. I am a professor of Russian and East European studies and a member of the graduate group in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also the author of a number of books looking at women and state socialism, both before and after 1989, probably most famously, Why Women Had Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. And I'm also the host of a podcast on the life and works of Alexandra Kollontai called AK-47 because I read and discuss 47 discrete works of Alexandra Kollontai's on the podcast. Wonderful. Well, Kristen, you are a multiple time return guest for Rev Left, a, a fan favorite and one of my favorite guests to have on. So it's always a pleasure and an honor to have you back on. And this topic with Alexandra Kollontai, her life, her work, her philosophy, couldn't have asked for a better guest to come on. And um, as we'll probably say at the end of this discussion as well, definitely check out AK-47 if you're interested in more Kollontai. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. But yeah, this is a long overdue podcast. Kollontai is a thinker that I think sometimes gets overlooked on the left when we look back at, at our heroes. I mean, probably not in the fe in feminist spaces, but on the left broadly. Um, so it's it's she's a figure that is really central to the Marxist feminist struggle, to Marxism and feminism separately and combined. And so I'm really excited to dive into her life and works. I think the best way to start, um, specifically maybe for people who might not know a lot about who she is, is just to sort of do an overview of who Colin Tai was, why she's an important historical figure. Not, I mean, for the left specifically, but just in general. You can take that question, however, wherever you want. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I just wanted to jump on something that you said and, and, and mentioned that she's also very much overlooked in Western feminist circles. I mean, I was just looking at various feminist theory readers, textbooks that are used to teach feminist theory at universities around the world. And she's often just completely erased, even though she's probably one of the most important figures when we're talking about kind of left feminism. And it's precisely because of her left feminism that she tends to be ignored in these historiographies of the global women's movement. So who was she? Uh, she was born in 1872 of the old Russian nobility. Her father was actually a general in the Tsar's army and her mother was a daughter of a very wealthy Finnish businessman. And she um, had a privileged, pretty privileged upbringing uh, because she, you know, she was expected to make a very good match. 
And um, she essentially becomes a revolutionary. She she sort of overrides her parents' wishes, marries a poor cousin, stays married for a couple of years. That doesn't work out. She has a son. And eventually she sort of self-radicalizes. She Her husband is an engineer who takes her to a textile factory in Narva um, where she sees absolutely appalling working conditions. Uh, her husband, who's this engineer, is uh, there to install a ventilator because workers, there are like 12,000 workers in this factory who work like 18 hour days locked in and they're breathing these fibers so that the workers last about three, four years before they die of tuberculosis. And she's just absolutely horrified by what she sees. And she starts reading socialist books. Um, she says herself that she came to socialism through books because she sort of self-taught herself. And what's really important about Kolontai is from that moment that she visits that factory in Narva, she becomes a committed revolutionary for the rest of her life. And why she's so important, I think, as a historical figure is because, first of all, she's what I would call a left fluid person. She she spends many years as a Menshevik, a social democrat. She really believes in the possibilities initially of reform or what in Russia is called revisionism and of just making the lives of the poor incrementally better if it's possible within the existing framework of the system. After World War I, she becomes a Bolshevik, largely because she's very much opposed to the imperialist war. But then after the Bolshevik Revolution, she sort of slides into what we would call anarcho-syndicalism, and she joins the workers' opposition. And then very late in life, uh, after she's sort of banished from the Soviet Union, she becomes more or less a stalwart supporter of Stalin in the Soviet Union, especially during the Second World War, largely because she hates Hitler and the fascists. So she was this very important revolutionary. She is appointed as the first commissar, commissar of social welfare in the Soviet Union right after the Bolshevik Revolution. She was very, very close with Lenin and Krupskaya, Lenin's wife, and Inessa Armand uh, in sort of setting up the infrastructure for women's involvement in the revolution. After her joining of this thing called the workers' opposition, the sort of more anarcho-syndicalist part of the Bolshevik party, she's sent away first uh, as a diplomat to Norway. Later, she is a the Soviet ambassador to Mexico. And then she spends many years as the Soviet ambassador to Sweden, and she's in Stockholm during the world, uh, Second World War. She's very important in brokering the peace between the Soviet Union and Finland after the Winter War, for which she is twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And aside from all of her kind of political work and diplomatic work, she was an incredible theorist of women's emancipation through socialism, of using Marxism and understanding the need to overthrow capitalism as an essential and fundamental part of women's emancipation. And in that, she was very much opposed to what she called the bourgeois feminists, what we would call probably the liberal feminists, the kind of hashtag girl boss feminists, leaning in to try to make women uh, equally able to access the highest echelons of wealth and power rather than actually trying to create social justice and equality for all men and women within the context of a more socialistic society. So as a theorist, as a politician, as a revolutionary, as a diplomat, she was an incredible incredibly important figure in the 20th century for women's movements internationally, a huge inspiration to many people, but unfortunately largely forgotten um, by both feminists and socialists to this day. Yeah, absolutely. I do think there is some sort of a resurgence uh, interest in her work very, very recently on the Marxist feminist left. 
Um, you know, I have many connections with Marxist feminists and Kalantai continually gets brought up more and more. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is a sort of resurgence of interest in her and hopefully we can help uh, add to that as well. But now that we've got the, the big pieces on the table and we have an overview of her life, let's kind of drill down into to some of the details. You mentioned that she was sort of an autodidact. She taught herself. Did she have any formal education? And when it came to her politics, did she have any really pronounced influences? Yeah. So, OK, so obviously because she was of of the upper classes, she was educated by private governesses at home. And so she was a polyglot. She spoke multiple languages. She was very, very well read. When she comes to socialism after her trip to this factory in Narva, one of the first books that she reads, which really radicalizes her, is August Bebel's Woman in Socialism. She also reads Friedrich Engels' uh, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. And obviously, she reads a slew of Marxist texts, which are available in translation at Russia at the end of the 19th century. When she decides to leave her husband and her child, which she does, she goes and studies for three years at the university in Zurich, in Switzerland, because uh, opportunities, obviously, for women in higher education in Russia were limited, but also she wanted to study Marxist economics. She actually wanted to go to where the center of some of these theories were being discussed, and at the time, it was Plekhanov who was really kind of the leading thinker of the party. And she, um, so she studies for, for three years in Zurich. But again, I think her formal studies are not as important, and she says this herself, as her own readings and interpretations of the books that she had available to her. In terms of her political influences, I think certain people play a really important role in her life. So as I mentioned, uh, Plekhanov was obviously very important early on. She is and uh, remains a Menshevik for quite a long period of time, largely because she, when she returns to Russia, she splits with her husband and she starts to become involved in agitating and organizing strikes among women workers textile workers, laundresses, a wide variety of women in St. Petersburg. And um, she's part of the 1905 failed attempt at revolution in Russia. And during her time in the underground, she is, even though she herself is more aligned with the Menshevik party, there's not such a big division at this point in time in Russia. And she has many, many Bolshevik friends. So Alexander Bogdanov, for instance, really kind of a Bolshevik Renaissance man who was a doctor and a science fiction writer and a philosopher, I think was a very important influence on her. And then in 1908, she is forced to flee Russia and lives in exile in Western Europe for nine years because the Tsarist police are after her for all of her revolutionary work. And at that period of time, she's living largely in Berlin. She travels all over Europe giving lectures. She's a very popular orator, a very... Um, a prolific writer. She's writing for all sorts of newspapers and doing translations because she speaks so many languages. But in Berlin, she becomes very close with Karl and Sophia Liebknecht, as well as Clara Zetkin. And uh, she has close relations with people like Karl Kautsky. These are all German members of the Social Democratic Party. And those are really kind of her her people. Uh, she's also, by the way, uh, in close contact with Rosa Luxemburg at this period of time. So these were kind of, this was the milieu in which she was moving. These were like the kind of luminaries of European German socialism at the time. And of course, ultimately, she breaks with them after the German Social Democratic Party votes war credits to the Kaiser at the beginning of World War I. And the only Figures in the German Social Democratic Party who oppose this are obviously Zetkin, uh, Luxembourg, as well as Liebknecht. And, um, and, and it is because of the Bolsheviks' principled stand against World War I in 1914. And she also has uh, an important love affair with a guy called Alexander Shlapnikov, who was a metal worker and a Bolshevik and later would become the first commissar of labor in the Soviet Union. And I think partially because of her 
belief in pacifism and against the war, and also because of her relationship with Shlapnikov, she becomes a Bolshevik in 1914. And that, and it's at that point that she really begins um, sort of reading all of these Bolshevik texts and, 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 and working together with Lenin. And as I said, Krupskaya and Armand, who are sort of helping Lenin formulate these Bolshevik positions as the war continues. So, so she's a, a really fascinating character in that she did have a formal education, but she also just was, by all accounts, an absolutely voracious reader who was very much on top of the pulse of everything that was being published, all the debates that were going on in Europe among the various sort of sectarian factions of leftism as they existed at that time. Yeah, incredibly interesting. And and the whole idea of even when provided the best of formal educations, uh, the need for self-education and for continuing education is is incredibly essential for anyone, you know, in general that wants to develop their intellect, but also people on the left. And um, we see that today with people needing, after going through the American uh, education, quote unquote, system, needing to engage in self-education to continue their own intellectual development. I did not actually know, I mean, I guess I never thought about it, that she had some sort of relationship with Rosa Luxemburg. How how deep was that particular relationship? Was it just writing a few letters or did they meet in person? Oh, no, no. They they met in person uh, many, many times. Uh, they went to many conferences together um, in 1907 at the first International Socialist uh, Women's Conference in Stuttgart. They went together. Uh, they um, Rosa Luxemburg was a very obviously important figure at the time in Germany. Uh, this was, you know, this is in the interwar, uh, this is, sorry, this is the pre-war period, right? So um, they moved in, in, in the very same circles. Uh, this is obviously before the First World War and the split and the formation of the Spartacus League. So, so Rosa Luxemburg, you know, would have been on the left, obviously, of those workers' movements, um, of the Social Democratic, uh, the German Social Democratic Party, but but Kolontai and and Luxembourg, all of them were were very close at that time. And actually, even you know during this period of time in in Berlin, there were she also taught uh, Kolontai taught lectured at Maxim Gorky's school in Italy. Uh, she was in Paris when Lenin and Krupskaya and Armand were uh, were running their summer school outside of of Paris. And when Lenin and Krupskaya were in Krakow for a while in, in Poland, the, they were in contact. Kolontai and Krupskaya and Lenin were also in contact because they were trying to set up a kind of women's um, newspaper. So, so all of these early sort of socialist figures, the kind of icons that we think of, um, they were definitely in contact with each other before World War I, before the big splits, right, between the social Democrats, between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, the social Democrats and the communists. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I would pay so much money to hang out with Luxembourg and Colin Tai yeah. and be right, a fly on right? the wall I for mean, those Can conflicts. you imagine being a fly <laughs> yeah, on the exactly. wall of that conversation? <laughs> I mean, it must have been absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I think they all really learned a lot from each other. I mean, again, later in her life, Kolontai also met uh, Emma Goldman mm. when Emma Goldman was in was in Russia, uh, was in the Soviet Union. And so all of these sort of figures, I mean, it was a pretty tight knit world back then. Right. And so they um, they were all in dialogue with each other in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. And even the disagreements between Kolontai and Goldman would have been fascinating to, to peek. In absolutely. On. Absolutely. So let's let's move on a little bit. You've mentioned some of her relationships to Bolsheviks, specifically in Bolshevism broadly, and, and her switch over from Menshevism to Bolshevism. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about specifically her relationship to Lenin, maybe some of the agreements and disagreements, and then uh, take us forward into the role that she played in the October Revolution. Yeah. Okay. So, th I mean, this is a great, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's so much material here, so I'll try to be brief, but I think what, what a lot of people don't realize, right, is that Lenin was, <laughs> was a very difficult man. Um, <laughs> and as you know, I, I, you know, he's, he's been so lionized. Um, he's sort of become his own me, but, but by all accounts, you know, if you read uh, Krupskaya's my reminiscences of Lenin, you know, all of the accounts that we have of Lenin was that, especially in this, 
this pre-war period, he was very much kind of alienated from the mainstream of the European left. And, you know, he was seen as a bit of a troublemaker. And, and um, he was a bit of a troublemaker, I suppose. But so what happens is that once Kolontai, and I think this is the value of, of self-education, is that she comes to be, when she becomes a Bolshevik, she does it out of her own conviction. And initially, she has a big disagreement with Lenin. This is what prevents, you know, initially prevents their relationship from really solidifying. And the disagreement is this. Kolontai is a pacifist. And she believes that all war is imperialist war and that there's, you know, that you're basically just throwing the sons of the proletariat out as cannon, cannon fodder. Um, Lenin has a different view of the First World War. Lenin believes that now that the peasants and the workers are armed because they're out there fighting on the front, that the working class of different armies should fraternize uh, form a coalition and use the guns that they've been given and the ammunition that they've been given to overthrow their capitalists back home. Um, and, and this is basically that the First World War should immediately turn into a civil war, which will bring about the revolution in Europe. And initially, Kolontai is absolutely opposed to this idea because she's opposed to violence and she's opposed to war. But slowly, Lenin, she comes to see Lenin's point of view. And once she realizes that Lenin is is right, that that there there can there has to be the possibility of national liberation, that there has to be the possibility of independence. You know, uh, Lenin tells her, I mean, if you're against imperialism, how can you not allow people living in colonial countries, right, under the yoke of imperialism, to rise up and overthrow their oppressors? They can't do that without violence. And Kolontai, when she finally agrees, she agrees and becomes sort of his deputy. When they return to Russia after the February Revolution in 1917, when the provisional government is in power, Alexander Kolontai is one of the few Bolsheviks who actually openly supports Lenin's call for a civil war in Russia. The provisional government, as I'm sure you know, uh, decides to stay in the war. There are huge desertions at the front. The Russians are sick of the war. Their, their economy is in ruins. There are food shortages. There are ammunition shortages. There are mutinies everywhere. But the provisional government under Kerensky decides to stay in the war. And uh, the reason that the Bolsheviks start to gain support is because they're so opposed to the war. And it's during this time, this, this really crucial period between February and October of 1917, that... Uh, by the way, Trotsky himself was also a former Menshevik. It's at this time that Trotsky and Kolontai, really the two of them, and one or two other key Bolsheviks, sort of tighten a circle around Lenin. And they go out there to the factories, to the laundries, out in the streets, and they, uh, through their orations and speeches, start to just massively gain support for Lenin and the Bolsheviks. I mean, they're his like frontline troops in terms of propaganda. Apparently, Kolontai was an amazing public speaker, as uh, so was Trotsky, by the way. And they were able to really consolidate power. And so when there's this, you know, secret meeting of the top Bolsheviks, uh, Kolontai at that period of time is the only woman. And there's a decision, there's a vote. I believe there are, I believe there are 12 of them in the room, including obviously people like uh, Kamenev and Zinoviev and Stalin and um, Trotsky, Lenin, you know, the others. And, and there's a vote about whether or not to have an armed insurrection against the provisional government. Um, you know, very famously, Kamenev and Zinoviev vote no, but all of the others, including Kolontai, votes yes. And so she's right there in the very center of power. It's, it's also important um, that she, during you know, this period of time, she is really instrumental in mobilizing women to support the Bolsheviks. 
And the Bolsheviks really needed the support of women because so many men were away at the front and, you know, women were working in the factories. And so the only way that this revolution, that the October Revolution was going to work was to make sure that they also had the support of especially proletarian women working in the cities. And Kolontai was absolutely essential. And so she, in, in the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution, uh, sorry, the, the October Revolution, she is appointed, uh, she's given a cabinet level, a ministerial position as the Commissar of Social Welfare. Um, and she just becomes one of that, the, the, the first Soviet government to kind of completely overturn uh, Tsarist Russia. And she does that by enacting you know, a couple of, of really wide ranging laws that have, at least in the initial period, the, the full support of Lenin and the other Bolsheviks. And I think that's the perfect way to, to lead into this next question, which is, you know, after the revolution, as you've hinted towards, can you just talk about some her, her positions within the communist government, as well as as the years go on, sort of her opposition to certain elements, factions and aspects of it? particularly uh, her relationship and attitude towards Stalin and his policies and how that attitude sort of shifted back and forth over time? Yeah. So so as I said, she is initially uh, appointed as the Commissar of Social Welfare, but she resigns her position in 1918 in response to the appalling uh, conditions of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, right, where, where the um, Lenin pulls Russia, Soviet Russia, out of the First World War. And um, from that moment on, she's a bit of a thorn in the side of Lenin and the other Bolsheviks. She supports them during the Civil War. She, she goes on a speaking tour uh, in Ukraine, and she's, a, you know, again, a very, very popular speaker. And so she's able to rouse a lot of support for the Red Army during the Civil War. But once the Civil War is over, there are a couple of, of big issues. One is that she's absolutely opposed to Lenin's new economic policy, which was a limited reintroduction of markets to get the Soviet economy up and running after the devastation of the First World War and the Second War. And two, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, where she sort of becomes more of a anarcho-syndicalist. In fact, Goldman later in her, um, in her book, My Further Disillusionment with Russia, really talks about Kolontai's principled stance on behalf of the workers. So as Lenin tries to consolidate, actually Lenin and Trotsky at this point, try to consolidate more and more central power, they are disenfranchising the trade unions. And the workers themselves who had supported the Bolshevik Revolution are really angry about this. And so Kolontai and um, this guy, uh, Shlapnikov, who she used to have a relationship with, she no longer does, but they remain very close political allies. They form this thing called the Workers' Opposition and uh, I believe the 20th Party Congress. Oh, I can't remember which party Congress. It's one of the party Congresses. Um, she presents a pamphlet where she basically outlines the, the stance of the Workers' Opposition and the fact that, look, the revolution said that they were going to increase, it was going to increase power to the workers. And what Lenin and Trotsky are trying to do is disenfranchise the workers by centralizing all political power over the economy to, you know, the, the Bolsheviks. Really quickly, what, what were, what was the logic of Lenin and Trotsky at that time for that move? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, look, the economy was a disaster. Um, it, the economy was a shambles. And, you know, I think we have to be realistic and understand that while there were some workers' councils that were very responsible in terms of increasing production in the immediate aftermath of the war, there were also workers' councils which, like, voted themselves raises and then voted themselves, like, two months off of vacation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, yeah, paid vacation, by the way. <laughs> nice. Right. And so so in order to and and especially, you know, the Civil War being what it was with all of the opposition that the Soviet state was facing from these Western capitalist countries, Lenin absolutely felt that the that the, the economy had to had to be jump started by some kind of centrally planned control and 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 very importantly, it also meant bringing back some of the bourgeois experts, the engineers and the foremen and, and some of the people who had um, had been kicked out, right, during the early years of the revolution. Well, it turns out that a lot of the, 
the workers in these factories didn't actually know how to fix a machine if it broke down or didn't know to ha actually how to organize production or get the supply chains going. So there were like a ton of practical economic issues that given the threats at the time, both Lenin and Trotsky felt required the centralization of economic control. Now, that was very much a betrayal of the, the slogan, all power to the Soviets, right? I mean, these this was supposed to be a worker state and the workers were supposed to be in control. But Lenin, you know, had this theory of the vanguard party and he wanted you know, this tightly disciplined group at the top to be organizing things. And, and, and so I think it's really important here that the Shlapnikov and Kolontai represent what's called the left opposition or the labor opposition or the workers opposition. It's been called various things by various people. And so it was actually a kind of further left tendency within the Bolshevik party in order to kind of live up to the ideals of the revolution. And, and both Lenin and Trotsky were merciless in their opposition to to Kolontai and Shlapnikov. They they silenced Shlapnikov by making him uh, a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and they basically ousted Kolontai. And they did it in a really nasty way by um, sort of insinuating that the only reason that she'd gotten involved in this struggle was because she was sleeping with Shlapnikov again, which just wasn't true. But um, but Lenin and Trotsky were really I mean, as we know, they were they were very um, there were there was a lot of faction factionalism. There was a lot of fears of sectarianism that, the, you know, the left would organize itself into a circular firing squad, as the left often does. And so they believed that this sort of strict kind of discipline was necessary for the time being. And Kolontai just believed, as did, by the way, Emma Goldman believe that once you set up that level of centralization and that level of bio bureaucracy, that it would never go away. Um, and they turn, they, turn, they both turned out to be right, <laughs> because as Stalin takes over, um, he, he further centralizes. There's just no possibility of going back to any kind of workers' council syndicalist model. So, so she's sort of pushed out of power um, and, and basically gets sent abroad to, you know, these diplomatic positions. And I think she's very upset by that. She's, you know, she's one of the few old Bolsheviks who actually survives Stalin's purges in the 30s. By the time of her death, she's the only one left. And um, I think that she may, you know, she does eventually, I think, accommodate herself to Stalin, and she does not in any way oppose him, not publicly and not privately. So that was, that was a sincere sort of acquiescence? I don't, you know, I mean, I've, I have spent a lot of time thinking about that, because I think she was, she was afraid for her son and her grandson, um, she knew that Stalin was was absolutely ruthless. So part of it, I think, was fear. I mean, quite understandably so. Both um, Shlapnikov and another um, husband of hers, a guy called Pavel Dubenko, were, were killed during the purges. I think the second uh, reason that she sort of stomached Stalin was, as I mentioned earlier, she hated fascism. And she saw the rise of fascism in Europe as a real threat. And she may have hoped that Stalin would be able to repel the, the pr protect the Soviet Union and repel the uh, fascist threat, which you know he does eventually. And um, but you know sometimes when I read, especially her later writings, I think she was just tired. I mean, you know, in 18, she was born in 1872. So in 1920, she's uh, like 50, right? Around just uh, 48, almost 50. Um, so, you know, she she's not a youngin when the revolution happens. Um, and by the time she's, you know, in this diplomatic position and she starts to really see what's happening with Stalin and what he's doing, First of all, she's not in the country. And second of all, I think, yeah, I think to a certain extent, she just is trying to protect the Soviet Union at all costs as, as, as much as she can. Um, they weren't close, Stalin and uh, Kolontai. 
they they knew each other from early revolutionary circles. He was sort of a nobody, right, in the early part of the the struggles before and after the the revolution. It's only, you know, he slowly starts to consolidate power as Lenin weakens, and um, he there's a there's a wonderful piece um, about Kolontai and Stalin. He was very patronizing and sexist <laughs> towards her. But but and another way of saying that is that he was also very chivalrous uh, because he also, by the way, keeps Krupskaya alive, uh, Lenin's widow. And so he he was ruthless with the with the old Bolsheviks who were men. But it seems that he may have had a, a bit of a soft spot for Kolontai or he just thought that she wasn't important enough to kill. She wasn't really a threat I'm not really sure. I mean, it's it's a great it's sort of one of those counterfactual questions that would be really fun to like write a novel about, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, to try to figure out what was going on there. But but there is no doubt in no doubt whatsoever that by the 30s, especially the late 30s, um, even despite the purges and she was she was gutted by the purges. There are some wonderful passages in a biography written by a woman named Isabel Palencia, who was um, from Republican Spain. They were both in, Nor uh, sorry, in Stockholm at the same time. And Kolontai's suffering during the, the purges was absolutely immense, but she never, ever spoke one word against Stalin. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is, we could spend a whole episode just diving into the, the counterfactuals and the whys yeah. and the hows. <laughs> There is this this sense, and that's what makes Stalin such a complicated figure. There's this ruthlessness, this this paranoia, this sort of absurdity, really, to him as a as a person. But there's also this relentless ruthlessness when aimed at the Nazi machine that clearly p paid off. And um, you know, her sort of needing to, or her sort of prioritizing perhaps the survival of the Soviet Union and the fight against fascism over her outward critiques of Stalin is interesting. And then, of course, there's this concern about other people in her life and, and whether they could get hurt by her stepping out and, and, and speaking out against Stalin, etc. It's just, it is incredibly complicated and endlessly fascinating for me to think through those, those things. And I think it's really important on the left that we take these, comp these complexities and these nuances seriously and really study the history and think through um, these, these problems, because I don't think the left is helped either by um, just a complete sort of indoctrinated Stalin was as bad as Hitler approach, nor um, an over romanticization of Stalin, which you sometimes see on the left either. Yeah, that's a real problem. That's a yeah. real problem, I think, yeah. as well. Because, I mean, even Colin Tai, right? I mean, she in her in her private diaries um, you know, which we know about because the secret police were reading them, right? She was yeah. very critical, right, of the purges, um, the, the, the just sort of wholesale um, massacre of all of these old Bolsheviks that had supported the revolution. And, and it's interesting because obviously she thought they were innocent, um, but she also was profoundly worried that if the Nazis attacked... Right. If there was a war, Stalin wouldn't have the kind of people around him that he would need in order to win the war against Germany. And, right. you know, she, you know, he he killed all of these people with revolutionary and military experience, many of them who had fought in the Civil War. And so, you know, it was just he was sort of decapitating um, the anti-fascist resistance. So I think she was critical of him you know, from that perspective. Now, again, I also think it's important that she was abroad for most of the time. And many people did not realize everything that was happening in mm. Russia. Um, but, you know, her doctor was purged. Many of her colleagues were purged. So she knew enough. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, I do think had she said something, probably A, nobody would have listened to her. Uh, partially because she had been, you know, somewhat discredited at that period of time because of her more sort of radical views on not only the workers' opposition, but on sexuality, which we can talk about in a second. But yeah, it's also very likely that Stalin would have killed her son and grandson. Um, and yeah, and that, I think, kept her mouth pretty sealed shut. Yeah. 
there's the there's the principled sort of conflict between like Lenin and Trotsky and Colin Tai and different factions. Uh, sort of the burden of a successful revolution is okay. Where do we go next? We're being attacked from all sides. You know, I, I understand those are legitimate debates and criticisms to have, and they're absolutely unavoidable. Um, but I, I think it, it should be completely sort of taken for granted on the left that the purges are absolutely grotesque, disgusting, not the proper or principled way to handle intra-party or intra-left debates and conflicts. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just absolutely. don't think that should be I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, there's this phenomenon of the tanky, right? And, yeah. um <laughs> And, you know, and and there is a kind of nostalgia, especially in Russia today, for Stalin, which I think is really interesting. I mean, largely the role that he played in the Second World War. Uh, But but it is, you know, there I don't think that for a second. Right. (laughs) Um, the, the, The way Stalin, the paranoia of Stalin in the 30s is excusable. Um, You know, there's just that has to be, you know, just absolutely made clear that, you know, that these things actually happened. It wasn't anti-Soviet propaganda or something like that made up by the West, which sometimes you kind of hear. And then the other thing is, and I think this is really important, is that Stalin also reversed quite significantly in 1936, almost all of the work that Kolontai had done to liberate women. And she was, you know, she also did not say anything about that and that to her was also very close to her heart yeah yeah incredibly messy (laughs) history to to wade through and i mean just as a side note uh, not that it's that relevant but um (laughs) the term tanky now has made its way into mainstream liberal discourse (laughs) so it's like i kind of blame like certain elements of the left that turn tanky into this like sort of vague insult towards anybody that's on like the marxist or leninist left and now you see like just like blue check mark liberal journalists <laughs> using the phrase which is sort of dizzying um, <laughs> right that's what happens you know yeah. these words circulate and they lose their, their original meaning, meanings yeah sure. well this is to, to end this biography section and we can move on to the sort of ideology contribution section just sort of briefly how did how did colin Tai's life sort of come to come to an end yeah, so you know, she um she negotiated this peace, very significant peace between Finland and the Soviet Union after the Winter War and she she always suffered from heart problems. She had a, a very serious heart attack in 1919 and and then she had many heart problems um in 1945 especially during during the war, the stresses and everything of the war. So she goes back to the Soviet Union after the Second World War, and she is, you know, decorated, uh, wildly celebrated um, as this, you know, she's like I said, one of the last old Bolsheviks standing, somebody who was actually there and important for the, the original revolution. And she's made a consultant for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She is given a very, you know, hefty pension. Uh, But her health deteriorates rather quickly. She has a stroke. She's paralyzed in half of her body. And she dies just a month, about a month before her 80th birthday in 1952. Um, And she spends really the last years of her life kind of organizing her papers and writing her memoirs. Um, And again, you know, not not really speaking out against Stalin and and not really participating in the rebuilding of the Soviet economy. I mean, by this point, she's in her late seventies, so she's rather frail. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to, to the next section. And, you know, as we've, as we know, and we've discussed, Alexander Kollontai was a pioneering figure, not only in Marxist feminism specifically, but in feminism broadly conceived. Can you talk a bit more about her, her specific contributions to the feminist cause and and maybe how her Marxism uh, just always shaped her feminism? Yeah. So again, this is, you know, I could teach a semester long course on this. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think the key thing here is that obviously following in the footsteps of people like Engels and Babel, but also earlier socialist feminists like Flora Tristan in France or Clara Zetkin in Germany, Kolontai really saw capitalism as the root of women's oppression. But it wasn't just the economic relations of capitalism in the workplace. It was also the economic relations of capitalism in the home. 
And she is, you know, one of the uh, first really outspoken women, uh, socialist women to really, she literally heckled feminists at their conferences. She would go in the audience and like shout while they were giving their speeches because she felt, as did Clara Zetkin, that women of the upper classes could not represent the interests of working women, right? We, we've talked about this on the show before, so I won't won't rehearse that argument here, but that there was a way in which women really needed to form strong coalitions with men, working class women and working class men, in over to in order to overthrow capitalism. And only then would both men and women truly be able to be free and liberated in an economy where their um, their needs, they had more power and control over the surplus value extracted from them. And then that surplus value could be redistributed to meet and raise living standards. So where her contribution, I think, is really key is the socialization of domestic work. So she is really on the front line, not only as a theorist in various essays that she wrote prior to the revolution, most notably the social basis of the woman's question. She also wrote a very long book called Society and Motherhood, where she just looked at the experience of how different European countries were providing social supports for women. And what she does as in her capacity as the Commissar of Social Welfare, she says, okay, in order to break the economic dependence of women in the family, women need to go out into the labor force and earn their own incomes. They need to be economically independent of their husbands and fathers, but they can't do that because of the way the family is organized and all of the cooking and cleaning and, and sewing and mending and the childcare that is done unpaid in the home. So Kolontai launches a massive program with the support of the Bolsheviks initially for the socialization of domestic work. And I think this is so important. It's one of the reasons we actually, if you, if any of you listeners out there have a kindergarten or, um, uh, you know, a preschool or a a nursery where you drop your kids off, you know, in many ways you have Alexandra Kolontai to thank for this because she really took some of these ideas and put them into practice in the sense that it's public provision of childcare public cafeterias, public laundries, public or uh, cooperative mending facilities, because mending was a really big deal um, for women at the time. So the socialization of, of, of domestic work was a kind of a key component of women's emancipation. And that could only be done if you had a worker state that was willing to redistribute surplus values in order to pay for the socialization of that labor. So then the other thing that I think, and so, you know, she has lots of really important ideas. I think that one's really key. And then the other one that I'll just br- um, briefly mention, because it's sort of um, one that I think the reason that she has enjoyed a kind of resurgence lately is precisely because of her sex positive essay, Make Way for Winged Eros, A Letter to Working Youth, which was published in 1923. And a lot of people are kind of reading and rereading and thinking and talking about this essay. And I think what's really interesting about the essay is that she does a Marxist analysis of love and sex. She, she's a historical materialist and she sort of applies the tools of historical materialism, of dialectical materialism to the family, to romance, to our concept of friendship and companionship. And she basically says that the model that existed in uh, Soviet Russia at the time and, and Tsarist Russia, which by the way is the model more or less that we still have today of the kind of heterosexual bourgeois monogamous family as the kind of basic family unit in society, that that is a specific way of organizing romantic relations that upholds capitalism. And she basically talks about earlier versions of love and fidelity in the ancient era and in the era of feudalism, which upheld those economic systems. And then she goes on to imagine a future socialist society where there will be this thing that she calls comradely love. Uh, Jody Dean has just written a wonderful um, book, you know, Comrade, which also kind of delves into this, this idea of comradely love. 
And the idea is a really actually, you know, beautiful and simple one. It, the idea is that if you live in a society which is completely depleting you of all of your affective resources, you're exhausted and, um, and alienated from your labor and from yourself, finding a romantic relationship, finding a partner becomes so important because it's the one thing that sort of humanizes the world for you, right? Somebody who treats you as special, somebody who treats you as important. And so in a capitalist society, the couple, that sort of romantic link between a man and a woman, and she was obviously speaking very specifically about heterosexual relationships at the time, although, you know, the, the Soviets did um, liberalize uh, same-sex relationships uh, very early on after the, the October Revolution, but she was specifically talking about the relationship between men and women. Um, she said that because people's emotions because the world is so precarious that that the the relationship between a man and a woman becomes one of property becomes becomes um, an egoistic relationship and you want to own the other person you want to possess the other person you don't want anyone to have anything of their time or attentions or energies and that this causes jealousy and it causes discord and ultimately unhappiness and that in a future socialist society, when everybody's needs are, you know, more or less met, when you have some social security and stability in your life, and you, you live in a society where everybody is concerned not only about their own individual needs, but also the needs of the collective, of the common good, that people will have much more experience expansive relationships they'll have you know what she calls this comradely love for many people these lateral relationships with neighbors and friends and colleagues and perhaps family members right so we'll all be embedded in these much richer social networks we'll have our material needs met we'll have our emotional needs met by multiple people. And so the romantic relationship between a man and a woman, again, it, it could be um, between any two people, will be less freighted, first with material cares and considerations and worries, and secondly, with this kind of egotistical possessiveness, right? because people will feel that they are validated and um, supported in a broader social network of people. And so for Kolontai, the goal of socialism is not only to you know, have um, state ownership of the means of production or workers control of the industries, you know, all of the kind of very economic public things that socialists always talk about. It was also about building a new idea of love, a new idea of comradeship that would support the sort of collective endeavor of the socialist society, that those two things had to go hand in hand. And I think that that is really an incredible contribution that she made to our understanding of the way that socialism and capitalism impacts our personal lives, which, as we've talked about on the show before, has been a really important inspiration to me and my work. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, I love her so much and such important contributions that many of us might take for granted today. But to trace these these lines back to Colin Ty, um, I think is really, really important. And I know on our sister podcast, Red Menace, we're going to be doing some deep dives into into her work, and I think we're still discussing which work to tackle first, but uh, if you want like some more deep dives into specific works by Colin Ty, definitely uh, pay attention to, to Red Menace, because we're definitely going to, to do work on that front. You know, I always think it's important to point out some legitimate criticisms of the figures that, w that we cover. So in your opinion, what are some criticisms of Colin Ty that you think are fair? And maybe you can also toss out a couple that you think are often lobbed her way that are more or less unfair. Yeah, so, so the fair ones are definitely her acquiescence to Stalin. Um, I mean, th there's just no way you can deny that, right? I mean, she she did not... She did not take a principled stand against him at any point, even when he was shooting her, you know, ex-husband and, and former comrades. Um, so, again, I think there are lots of interesting 
lots of interesting discussions about why that was. The other thing is that in some of her writings, and again, this is a, a product of the time, she had some eugenicist tendencies, right? She talks sometimes about like the hygiene of the race so that people with, for instance, um, certain kinds of disabilities should not reproduce. I think, you know, that's kind of a um, unpleasant reality of, of, of her work. And it's definitely there. You can find evidence of that. As I said, that was a pretty common uh, at that particular period of time in Europe as a whole. There were a lot of people sort of talking about, you know, Darwin's theories and, and thinking about things like natural selection and, and trying to, quote unquote, improve the the human race, you know, build the new socialist man. Um, and, you know, we see, we see very clearly where that led into the Second World War. So that's a fair criticism. The third thing that I would say was that even though she herself sort of abandoned her young son <laughs> when he was only like three years old or whatever, um, and she was, you know, she, she, she saw him fairly often and she worried about him all the lot, a lot, but motherhood was really not the most important thing in her life, but she is really very pronatalist. I would say she really focuses on motherhood and she thinks that motherhood for women is sort of a duty to the socialist state. Women have a responsibility to bring new socialist citizens into the world. And I find that a little bit problematic, especially since she herself, you know, she had this one child when she was young, but she didn't really sort of practice what she preached, so to speak, on that. And that, I think, is a really fair criticism of, of, of Colin Ty's work. She, she talks about reimagining the family, like, and, and she is instrumental in the legalization in 1920 when the so of abortion. Soviet Union is the first country in the world to legalize abortion on demand during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And so she understands very well the relationship between women's um, ability to control their fertility and their economic independence. And yet at the same time, she really spends a lot of time in her writings admonishing women to have children. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of a contradiction there. Like she's okay with the socialization of the family. She wants the state to actually play a big role in alleviating women's cares in this regard, but she's not really keen to allow women the choice of whether or not they have families. Um, and I think that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a, a, a criticism that is a fair criticism of Colin Tai. There are a lot of unfair ones. Uh, there's a misunderstanding that comes from a conversation uh, that was recorded by Clara Zetkin with Lenin. That, and that is that somehow Colin Tai's version of free love equals kind of promiscuity. Um, the so-called glass of water theory, which is that sex it should be is like hunger and thirst, and so you should should be no more important to you than just drinking a glass of water if you're thirsty. And in fact, that's not at all what she says. If you read, if you read Make Way for Winged Arrows, she's very clearly making a distinction between what she calls wingless eros, E-R-O-S, um, and winged eros. And the wingless eros is is promise is you know just sort of what we would call kind of random hookups, right? Kind of um, sexual relations that don't have any kind of emotional attachment to them. And she says, okay, well, during the revolution, when everybody's really busy and things are kind of crazy, it's sort of understandable that people would do that. But once we start to build socialism and we have this more robust collective and, and we're you know creating the conditions for the development of comradely love, then the relationship between two people will be this winged eros, which will be really sort of beautiful and based on mutual interests and attraction and affection. And, um, and that's really the goal. So in some ways, she's kind of a romantic, right? She's sort of like the original hippie. Um, she has this sort of weird, uh, you know, kind of eclectic at the time, especially idea of love that is not just about random hookups, right? It's, it's not just friends with benefits. It's, it's this sort of almost kind of mystifying view of finding your soulmate or a, a series of soulmates over the course of your life with whom you share interests and 
um, affinities. And then that will be the, the highest form of socialist love. And so to, to kind of paint her as a simple free love radical misses the nuance in her views. Now, she was not in any way critical of winged eros. You know, she was fine with the hookup culture. And in fact, she's um, largely responsible for the creation of these quote unquote civil marriages, right? You know, she makes it much easier for people to, to get married and divorce in the Soviet Union. And she understands that people are going to have serial monogamy. She herself, you know, had a number of, of, of relationships. And, and she was not at all opposed to what we might consider today things like polyamory. Um, she explicitly states that you might have uh, multiple people that you're um, in love with or you have these comradely relationships, relationships with. But, um, but she definitely saw just sort of, you know, what we would think of as sort of random hookups as kind of a lesser form of love. And to kind of, and, and Lenin, unfortunately, I think is the origin of the stereotype that that's what she represents. Yeah, really, really interesting, really principled takes, uh, really clarifying as well, because the, the water does get muddy around some of these, some of these uh, elements of her thought and stuff. And, you know, sort of zooming in towards the end of our conversation, a couple more questions. And one I really want to ask is just, you know, given that Colin Tai is such an influence on you and you've done so much study and research into her life, what aspects of maybe her personality or her life or her work do you think maybe are, are overlooked or that you found particularly interesting that m might not get as much attention as perhaps it deserves or, or just something that is just quirky and weird about her? So it's, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that it's quirky and weird, although I think it's fascinating and it's definitely overlooked. So, and it has to do with her personal life in some ways. So Colin Tai was married very young. She was like 21 when she married her first husband, obviously Vladimir Colin Tai, from whom she takes her name. Um, and then she had a series of, of lovers, uh, sort of a serial monogamy sort of situation over the course of her life, two, you know, two of whom were significantly younger than she was. Uh, the first was 13 years, her junior, Shlapnikov, I mentioned him. And then she later marries a guy called Pavel Debenka, who's 16 years younger than, than she is. And... Um, the thing that I find really fascinating about Colin Tai is there's often a lot of discussion of her. Well, okay, let's face it. She actually published her autobiography in 1926 and she titled it the autobiography of a sexually emancipated communist woman. Right. Nice. So <laughs> she was very proud of her sort of conquest um, in, ter in that, in that realm. However, one of the things that is very overlooked about her is that, when she was six years old, she spent a year with her father in Bulgaria. Her father, uh, General Domontovich, was sent to Bulgaria to help the Bulgarians write a liberal constitution after their freedom from the Ottoman Empire in 1878. And she makes a friend called Zoya Shadurskaya. And Zoya and Kolontai pretty much spend the rest of their lives kind of together um, until Zoya's death in 1939. And, 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 and Kolontai herself says that apart from her son, Zoya is the most dear person in her life. And Zoya moves in with Alexander Kolontai right after the birth of her son in St. Petersburg in the late 19th century. Uh, when when Kolontai goes into exile, Zoya follows uh, Kolontai. They they often live together in various cities around Europe. Zoya uh, lives with Kolontai in the immediate aftermath, before and after the uh, Russian Revolution. Um, especially when Emma Goldman uh, goes to visit uh, Kolontai, she's living in the Hotel National in in uh, Moscow with Zoya and her son. And then when Kolontai becomes a diplomat in, in, in Sweden, um, Zoya is a frequent visitor uh, of hers. And so Kolontai basically had a very passionate friendship with this Bulgarian woman who, by the way, Zoya never married. Uh, she was a self-supporting journalist, which made it really easy for her to kind of pick up her life and follow Kolontai wherever Kolontai happened to be going. 
And Zoya and Kolontai were obviously, you know, very, very, very close. Everything that you read in the biographies, everything that you read uh, from other people about them was that they had a kind of really special connection to each other. And I think that that's really interesting because much is made of Kolontai's love affairs. But in fact, in the background, I think what may have made these love affairs all possible one way or another, um, all the heartbreaks that she went through and survived, was the fact that she basically was kind of in a long-term, really long-term relationship with somebody that she knew when she was six, right? Um, and that, I think, is a, a part of, of Colin Tai's life that often does not get discussed, um, you know, partially because we don't really know a lot about Shadurskaya. Uh, she was not as prolific a writer as Kolontai, and she was never a really prominent figure in, in any way. She was a journalist who basically sort of supported herself by writing for various newspapers. But the fact that she was such an important part of Kolontai's life, and she always seemed to be there for Kolontai when Kolontai needed her most, I think, you know, opens up the possibility that, that Colin Tai was really living what this sort of comradely love that she talked about, right? She was actually building that in her own personal life. Yeah, beautiful. I, I had no idea about that at all. So that is incredibly fascinating. So overall, as a way to maybe end this conversation, and I always like this question because it's an important sort of way to wrap up these discussions. What are some of the, the main lessons or inspirations that the contemporary left, Marxist, feminist, or otherwise, can take from the life and work of Alexandra Kollontai? So I think that, so there are a couple of things, and I, I, I want to read you, if I can find it, a quote. Because, I, I, I mean, again, like I have an entire, you know, two years worth of a podcast about yeah, exactly. her at this point. So it's like everything about her life is really fascinating. I mean, what do you want? Um, <laughs> but uh, you're asking the wrong person. But the one, but, uh, the one thing that I will say um, that I think is really important is this idea of doing the work that we need to support each other emotionally within the movement. So there is this incredible speech that she gives. Um, I'm trying to, to find the exact, um, yeah, here it is. So Emma Goldman, so J John Reed was an American journalist in the Soviet Union uh, for the revolution. He's very famously the guy who wrote the book, 10 Days That Shook the World. And in, in 1920, Emma Goldman was in, um, was in Russia, obviously, and in 1920, first Inessa Arman died quite suddenly of cholera. And then two months later, John Reed died. And uh, Emma Goldman, whose initial impression of Kolontai was that she was kind of a grand dame and not really a real revolutionary. You know, she was, she was an aristocrat after all, and she was always very well dressed and everything like that. Goldman was really moved by Kolontai's speech over John Reed's grave. And, um, and she reports the speech. Um, she gives an excerpt of the speech in her book. She says, this is Colin Tai, who is reflecting not only now on the death of John Reed, but also on the death of, of Armand. We call ourselves communists, but are we really that? Do we not draw the life essence from those who come to us? And when they are no longer of use, we let them fall by the wayside, neglected and forgotten. Our communism and our comradeship are dead letters if we do not give out of ourselves to those who need us. Let us beware of such communism. It slays the best in our ranks. And I just think that that really captures something about how important it is for us to not only think about getting our politics right, and you know, especially on the left, I think we have all of these debates about the right political way or the right, you know, theoretical framework or the right practical strategy to achieve our goals. How do we build coalitions? How do we, you know, reach out to people that we might not otherwise cooperate with? How do we deal with hierarchies of race and gender and sexuality? But underlying all of those questions is the sort of basic emotional need to take care of each other. And this is why I really loved um, Jody Dean's book, this idea of comradeship, 
And I think a little bit we've lost that sense of, of how important it is to be comrades to each other. Um, and, that, and I think Colin Ty's life, you know, again, it's very complicated and there are many criticisms that you could address to her writings and, and her thinking. And it is, you know, hard to necessarily update somebody who was writing over a century ago to the, you know, 20 to 2021 and, and the post-pandemic world that we're about to hopefully be living in. Um, but I do think that the one essential concept is this the importance of emotional um, support for each other in what is, as we will all recognize, a really difficult struggle. It was back then, and it remains so to this day. Capitalism is very pernicious. It's emotionally draining and exhausting to constantly be outraged against the, the injustices that we see around us in the world and to constantly be thinking and working towards somehow rectifying those injustices. And so Colin Ty really admonishes us to care for each other. And I think that's a really important message. Absolutely gorgeous, uh, heart-rending quote and beautifully said on your part as well. Um, and, and it's it's a perpetual problem. Um, us uh, on the left, I mean, you know, we are operating in horrific times. And there, as you said, there's so much heartbreak every single day. Um, but a, a gentle, loving reminder to be gentle with ourselves and with one another um, I think is always going to be relevant and is especially relevant in these times. And I'll have to have, me and Jody have been talking about her coming back on the show. I'll have to have her on to, to do a whole episode on her, on her book, Comrades. Um, but yeah, beautifully said. Um, Kristen, it is always a pleasure to have you on. Every time you come on, I, I deepen my understanding of history and the world. And um, you're always welcome on Rev Left. Uh, before I let you go, can you please let maybe listeners know where they can learn more about Colin Ty and then importantly, where they can find you and your work online? Yeah, so um, there are three, actually four excellent biographies of her in English. There are many others in other languages, but the, the, the four that are in English, the first one is Isabel de Palencia, which I mentioned. I think it's out of print, but it's easily found uh, you know, in used uh, used book spaces. Um, Barbara Ann Clements has a book called Bolshevik Feminist. Uh, Kathy Porter's book has just been reissued. I just think it's called um, Alexandra Kolontai, A Biography. And then there's another one, uh, Beatrice Farnsworth uh, wrote that one. I can't, I think it's also just called a Alexandra Kolontai. Um, but those are available, easily found online. All of Kolontai's writings in English are available on Marxist.org. Well, not all of them, but a, a good, because <laughs> there are a lot of them, um, but the ones that have been translated and uh, for which we have permissions to post, they're all available on Marxist.org. Very recently, uh, Sternberg Press came out with something called Red Love, a Reader, which is a collection put together by the uh, an artist, um, I think in Sweden, uh, reflecting on Kolontai's life and, and her importance around questions of, of love and, and sexuality. And, um, and of course, you know, if, if people are, are interested, there's my podcast, which is, which I've been doing now for a little bit over two years. It's kind of episodic. Uh, I get to it when I get to it among all of my other obligations, but that's AK 47. Uh, you can find that on, you know, Apple podcasts and Spotify, or you can go directly uh, to the webpage, which is just AK 47 dot buzz sprout b u z z s p r o u t dot com buzz sprout dot com um, and all of the episodes are are posted there and uh, yeah I mean recently I think there's been a quite a lot of really interesting you know rediscovery of of Kolontai and her work and I think you know people should the thing that I do on my podcast, which is I actually read the originals and then I try to give them some contemporary context and discuss the kind of theoretical implications of them. I really think Colin Tai's work is pretty accessible. And if, you know, if you don't want to listen to it in podcast form, you can definitely go to these, those originals that are available on Marxist.org and get a sense and a sample of the kinds of things that she was writing about. Yeah, perfect. And I'll link to that in the show notes to make that as easy as possible for people to find. And I can't recommend AK-47 enough. It's a wonderful podcast and a deep dive into everything, Colin Ty. Thank you again, Kristen. It's always a pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me back. I always love doing this.
Here is an article by Kristen Godsey on Colin Ty entitled, The Most Famous Feminist You've Never Heard Of. A century ago, our newspapers couldn't stop writing about the Russian, Alexandra Kollontai, a woman so dangerous the United States government deemed her a national security risk. In 1918, Current Opinion called her the heroine of the Bolsheviki upheaval in Petrograd and announced to its incredulous readers that, quote, she holds a cabinet portfolio, dresses like a Parisian, and does not believe in marriage. In 1924, the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote that, quote, communist Valkyrie is a match for any man in diplomacy. A year later, the New York Times accused her of arranging fake marriages to promote red propaganda in Norway. In 1927, the Washington Post revealed that the new Soviet diplomatic envoy to Mexico, quote, who has had six husbands, had been refused a landing in the United States. Her worldwide reputation as the Red Rose of the Revolution, or the Jeanne d'Arc of the Proletariat, unsettled the Americans, who feared her mere presence might incite public disorder. Although she once crisscrossed the globe advocating for women's rights, most Americans know nothing of her life or work today. In the stories written and recycled each year for Women's History Month, Kalantai never makes the pantheon of activist goddesses worthy of adulation. Because she was a socialist, Kalantai gets written out of the her stories of global feminism. Alexandra Milkanova Domitovich was born in St. Petersburg in 1872, the daughter of an aristocratic Russian general. As a child, Alexandra learned to abhor the transactional nature of marriage after watching an elder sister marry a rich man 50 years her senior. Defiant of her mother's expectations that she should also make a good marriage, Alexandra wed a poor cousin, Kalantai, at 21. She gave birth to a son, but motherhood could not suppress her growing passion for politics. Although there was already a Russian women's movement, Alexandra Kalantai believed that the bourgeois feminists could never free working class women from oppression. She argued that the fight for women's emancipation would only succeed if working women allied with economically disadvantaged men to overthrow the Tsar. In the early 1900s, she agitated among female textile workers in St. Petersburg, leading reading groups, writing and smuggling radical pamphlets, and raising funds to protect striking women and their families. Hunted by the secret police, Kalantai spent years in and out of prison as an exile in Western Europe. She even came to the United States in 1915, visiting 81 cities and delivering over a hundred lectures speaking on socialism, women's rights, and pacifism in four different languages. In 1917, she returned to Russia and Lenin appointed her the Commissar of Social Welfare in the first Soviet cabinet. Kalantai oversaw dramatic revisions in Russian family law and helped organize the rapid socialization of women's domestic work through a vast network of public children's homes, laundries, cafeterias, and mending cooperatives. The new family code overturned centuries of patriarchal and ecclesiastical authority over women's lives, scrapping all legislation that once reduced women to the property of their fathers or husbands. The new Soviet constitution recognized men and women as equals for the first time in Russian history. Although Kalantai entered diplomatic service abroad after 1924, and Stalin eventually reversed most of Kalantai's work, she did manage to survive the violent purges of the 1930s. She served as the ambassador to Sweden throughout the Second World War and was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1946 and 1947 for brokering the Finnish-Soviet ceasefire. After World War II, East European nations hoping to mobilize women into the labor force implemented updated versions of Kalantai's early Soviet reforms. Through global networks of socialist solidarity, policies to liberalize divorce, expand parental leaves, build kindergartens, and socialize domestic work spread across the globe to countries like China, Cuba, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. Kalantai's emphasis on the public provision of services for women and children infused the key international United Nations Treaty on Women's Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which has been ratified by 187 countries, but not the United States.
Even so, American women benefited indirectly from Kollontai's long history of activism because Cold War superpower rivalries forced the U.S. government to pay attention to women's rights. In many ways, we live in the world that Kollontai helped create 100 years ago. But when I think of Kollontai and her legacy today, I also remember the tale of how she saved a colleague's parents from the Nazis. It was 1940, and the Germans had just overrun Norway. Having already escaped one from a concentration camp, a man named Hans Serf turned up, desperate, in the Soviet embassy in Stockholm. As German Jews trying to get out of Europe, Hans and his wife needed Soviet transit visas. After an initial inquiry, the clerk told Hans visas required six weeks of background investigations, but at any time the Germans might invade and ship them off to Auschwitz. At that exact moment, Hans recounts, quote, the door opened and a beautiful, bosomy lady, all in black, stormed in in a hurry. Momentarily, I realized that this must be Madame Kollontai, the Russian ambassador to Sweden. Now, Hans, I said to myself, where is your Russian? I stepped before the lady. Listen, comrade Kollontai, I am a comrade too, and I have to get out, now. Kollontai looked him up and down and decided she liked him. She turned to her clerk and ordered him to grant the visa. Hans hastily explained that he also needed one for his wife. Give me two, Kalantai commanded and disappeared. As a woman in a rare position of power, Kalantai used her authority to ensure that Hans and Kate Cerf escaped. If it weren't for Madame Kalantai, I would never have been born. My colleague, Stephen Cerf, a professor in the German department, wrote to me one day, Madame Kalantai is a hero in our family. Our collective feminist history is littered with tales of extraordinary women who fought tirelessly for equality, peace, and justice. And we must expand this history to better include the many activists and leaders like Kalantai who lived and struggled to promote the ideals of socialism. But this year, as the lead-up to perhaps the most important presidential election of our lives renders the political climate ever more polarized, contentious, and cruel, it's worth remembering that small acts of extraordinary kindness can leave as lasting an impact as a lifetime dedicated to a larger cause.